Welcome to the Coder Kids podcast. Today, I have a new camera and we have a special guest. So um, welcome to the program again. I'd like to introduce Victoria Ransom. She is the founder of Prisma. Now, there are a bunch of different Prismas out there. This one has to do with education. So we'll be talking about that today. And a little bit, I assume, the philosophy of education and different ways to make that work for for kids. So welcome to the program. Is there anything you feel like I left out? That sounds good. Great stat. Okay. Nice to be here. Perfect. Well, we are, I guess, in, in Texas and California, respectively. So we're, we're really representing the big states today. So that's great. Um, well, first off, I want to talk to you, I guess, a little bit from a business angle. You know, um, us small business people, we're always trying to fix problems mm-hmm. and um, gaps in the marketplace. And we both care about education. Um, what is the problem that you're trying to solve with Prisma? Right. Well, I mean, we really, and this started with a, you know, I can sort of tell the story of how we came to for start sure. Prisma and it, and it really started originally with us trying to solve a problem for our very own family. Uh, but I think the problem we're trying to solve for our family is the same as the problem we're trying to solve for every family out there that's interested in a Prisma like education, which is sure. to just find an education that does two things and we struggle to find this out there one is gets kids really really excited about learning because we think if kids are excited about learning then they will achieve their best and it's very hard to achieve your best if you're not excited uh and the other is uh to develop a model of education that just really prepares kids for the world that they're going to live in if you look at that a traditional model of education, it, it has evolved, but not much. It is mm. largely the same sort of model and format that our parents were doing and their parents were doing. And yet our world is just moving at light speed. Yeah. Uh, and particularly for this generation of kids, I think they're going to face a level of change that is pretty unprecedented. I think many things are driving that, AI being one of them. So, you know, there are studies out there that say today's elementary school kids, I think 65% of them will work in jobs that have yet to even be invented. And yet we sort of have a school system that's based on preparing kids for jobs that we know, like lawyer and doctor and yeah. whatever. Um, and we and still need them, but yeah. <laughs> well, for now we do. Who yeah. knows? Who knows yeah. if what lawyer will look like 20 years from now or even doctor? I think it's going to be a very different job. So, um you know, we're very much focused on providing a model of education that will bring out the best in kids and prepare them for the kind of world that they're going to live in. Um, and, you know, can talk more about how we do that. But but that is the problem we're trying to solve. And, and I think the other piece is to do that in a way that can reach large numbers of kids. Because there are some really very interesting, very innovative sort of one-off schools here and there, a little sort of micro school here or an independent yeah. school there. But so often they are, you know, reaching just a very small number of kids, often with a pretty hefty price tag. And so we also had the goal of uh, if we can find this sort of fantastic educational model that does what I just said, to do it in a way where we could scale it and reach large numbers of kids um, if we find that it's working, which so far, we're really finding that we're delivering on, on what I just said, getting kids excited about learning and preparing them in holistic ways. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, gosh, there are so many jump off points. But the, one of the first things you said was, uh, you know, an exciting education or, you know, to provide excitement. I just had a parent call in this morning. No lie, right? They called in uh, about one of the, the after school programs we have. And they said, yeah, but is it fun? Yeah, they they literally said that, and I said it absolutely right. Um, we des- we design for fun, and one of the things that I learned, I used to I used to say like internally to my instructors, like you know we do fifty percent fun, fifty percent educational, and then instructors didn't take the fun part seriously, mm. like <laughs> they just didn't. So I now we say fifty one percent fun, forty nine percent educational, and and it's not like a percentage of the time in class obviously there's like clear overlap but it's more we found and I, I found this through you know hard experience where if a class wasn't engaging if it wasn't challenging 
if it wasn't collaborative, then nobody was learning anything anyway. Right. And, and that was rough to think about. Like if you only think about academic success and if you kind of exclude everything else for that, you actually end up with less academic success, which yeah. really blew my mind. But, uh, you know, now we've kind of sorted things out, but um, that part about excitement, I just, it's really hard to overemphasize. We yeah. tend to like do things that we love, at least, you know, when we kind of come into ourselves and I, you know, obviously you're the guest, I don't want to talk too much, but like, I really find that that buy-in is super important. So yeah, how yeah. do you, how do you create that buy-in, you know, with Prisma students in particular? Where is it, where does that excitement or how does, where it, does it come like? from? Yeah. 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 And you know, uh, we're still a young model and young organization, but I'm pleased to support that at the end of the last year, we survey our kids a lot, but True. in our final survey, 100% of kids said they were more excited about uh, school and enjoying school at Prisma than they were previously. And these are kids that have come from homeschooling, private schooling, public schooling backgrounds. Yeah. So we're doing something right, which doesn't mean we've found the Holy Grail, but we're doing something right, I think, um, in terms of getting kids excited. And there's a few things we do. One is we have a strong belief in giving kids choice. So that's not like a free for all, do whatever you want. We sure. particularly with the age groups we operate in, which is fourth through eighth grade, we found that providing some frameworks and some constraints is actually really important. So rather than saying, just do a project about anything you like, it'll usually be like, you know, here's the theme we're focused on and here's a number of project options. Which one are you most excited about? But just this general idea about giving kids choice and giving them control and frankly responsibility over their learning. We think not only does that help with um, excitement, but that is just a beautiful, extremely important skill of kids yeah. learning to have responsibility for their own learning. So choice is really important to us. Um, meeting kids where they're at is extremely important to getting them excited about learning. We found, if you think about sort of the traditional educational model, it's like, okay, you're age 10, so you're in this grade and you're meant to know this. But yeah. you know, in any given classroom, you've got X number of kids, usually quite a few, that are frankly capable of doing more advanced work. So they're sitting there kind of bored. And you've got X number of kids that haven't grasped the materials from last year. So try to throw a bunch, you know, the next grade level at them and they're feeling even more lost that they're not enjoying it because frankly, they're not feeling successful. Um, so meeting kids where they're at, wherever that is. So we don't look at what grade are you in. We just look at where you're at in any given reading, writing, math and, and sort of slot you in where you're going to be successful and then let you go at your own pace. If you love math and you want to zoom through a bunch of grade levels in one year great do that if you need to take your time do that so it's sort of about you know getting kids excited about learning is helping them to feel successful with their learning and and to your point you said it before to, to help them feel challenged um because every everybody likes a challenge as long as it's at the right level um so meeting kids where they're at is really important um hands-on sort of learning in a hands-on um, applied way is extremely important to us we, we really want kids because I think this happens so often in school kids are sitting there saying why am I learning this when will I ever need this so we really want to start with <laughs> why should you care about this like why is this important to you and then uh, let's apply this learning to something that's going to feel real and tangible like um, you know the next uh, theme that we're going to have that the kids are going to be working on is build a business. So you can learn a ton about math and economics and writing oh, and yeah. um, persuasion, but they're doing it in this applied way instead of like, let's learn this math concept sort of, you know, devoid of any context. So um, that is extremely important to us. Um, and then just learning as part of a community of kids that's really supportive. And we have coaches at Prisma. Every kid is, a, is given a mentor coach that really gets to know them, what makes them tick, what they're excited about. So sort of, you know, surrounding kids by a supportive group of kids and coaches that really know them and care about them, I think also really helps to make learning fun and exciting and to feel successful um so those are some of the things that we focused on that really have you know we've heard these beautiful stories from parents of kids 
that had really sort of given up on themselves or had just really lost interest in learning that we really sparked that in them again. Well, that that is really great. Yeah, you, you truly can learn quite a bit um, running a business in terms of math and economics and demand and, you know, customer support and all, all Vision, kinds of things. Communication. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly. I mean, so I learned, you know, certainly more math um, outside, right? You know, in, yeah. inside of Coder Kids, I, I created my own little formula, right? That that it's it's literally the formula. If you go to our website and look what courses cost, that I've created a formula for that. So I basically take all the costs, you know, how much how much it takes to, you know, provide an instructor with a reasonable rate and, you know, that rate changes and so I can adjust these little things here and there and how many students register for a class and it just takes in all these different variables and then it it, it comes out with with um you know something that works right and so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so um basically uh I, I set the minimum price that can meet the the standards of the formula and right so that that's that's basically my goal and um i use that all the time <laughs> i use right. that math every single day and so for me i really like that has stuck and I, I think that's what's different, right? So I went to college, I, I got a history uh, degree and then a philosophy minor. Mm-hmm. It was a ton of fun. It was basically like grown up story hour, I tell people. That's what it was like, you know, a little bit more academic story hour. And I learned a lot about history. I love history. But it really mm-hmm. didn't, um, you know, it didn't really like send me into any like marketable skills that help prepare me a tiny bit for being a teacher in terms of like the mm-hmm. content. Um, but even hardly that that's, I all kind of did that afterward. And so, you know, it, I do think, yeah, there are different ways to do things, but when you apply your learning, that's really when it, when it yeah. sticks. So because, what are some of these, you go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, already, sort of this idea of like you prepare for a career and then you do that career for your whole lifetime. I think that's already an obsolete concept. For sure. Um, Most people change careers pretty regularly, um, but even more so for this generation of kids. It is highly unlikely, I think, that they're going to prepare for a career and do that career their whole lives. They're probably going to have to reinvent themselves multiple times. I think increasingly people will have to be sort of very entrepreneurial in how they earn a living. And... um, And so what are the skills you need to be able to be adaptable and reinvent yourselves? It is not like you said, like having sort of deep knowledge in some particular academic discipline, not to say that academics are not important. They are. And school still sort of operates on that. But what you really need is the ability to be a creative thinker, to be an excellent communicator and be able to collaborate well with others, to be a great researcher, to be adaptable and um, have, uh, you know, really power through in the face of challenges. And, and, you know, already that's my experience in my career. It's people with those foundational skills that really seem to succeed in their careers and their lives. Not the ones that were like the geniuses in, I don't know what subject in high school. Um, so that, you know, that, that's what we, we absolutely are, um, making sure that our kids are developing in core academics. And in fact, we, we do um, uh, some sort of standardized assessment and we see that they're growing fantastically, actually. Our kids last year grew at 154% of expected growth in math and 174% of expected growth in reading. So, yes, we are, in, we are finding great academic growth, but we care just as much that we're seeing kids really develop that resilience and their ability to... Um, be independent and to be excellent researchers and to really communicate well. Because you can have all the best ideas in the world. If you can't communicate them well, nobody listens to you. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Th- those are the things <laughs> we true. really are focused on. So you said two things which might seemingly be contradictory. I want to dig into this a little okay. bit. You said, sure. you said you want to help kids, you know, learn to be independent. And mm-hmm. then... Right before that and after that, you talked about them working really well with others. So can you can you describe sure. that and like what are the things you use for, for both? Are they really opposites? Yeah, can you dive into sure. that? 
Yeah, and I think what I mean by independent is the ability to, you know, uh, set goals and achieve those goals without some authority figure, whether it's a parent or a teacher, basically mm-hmm. saying, do this, do it now, and I'm going to nudge you along. Or even things like grades are a, they're an extrinsic motivation to get kids to do something. Some kids care about them, some kids don't. But either way, you are not um, encouraging kids to be self-motivated about their learning and to learn intrinsically for the the value and joy of learning. You are providing sort of an external motivator to try to get them to do what you want them to do. So when we say independence, we don't mean working alone because there's very few people who just completely work alone um, in the world. Um, But it's more about your ability to self-motivate, to set goals, to manage your schedule, um, the kind of things that I think the traditional school system doesn't really um, allow kids to to sort of develop because when you're trying to manage a bunch of kids all at once, it's easier to tell them, do this, do it now, do it in this way. Um, And yet I think for a lot of kids who succeed beautifully in the traditional school system, they get into adult life, be it college or their first job, and it's a really quite a big shock because suddenly they have to manage their own schedule. Nobody's telling them to get out of bed. Nobody's telling them what their goals should be. So that's what we mean by independence. Collaboration, uh, you know, we think that's incredibly important because almost everything you do in life involves working with others, persuading others, listening to others, adapting to others. Um, and so, you know, you asked how we do those things. On the independence front, we just give kids a lot of um, choices and options. So, you know, they get to um, develop their own schedule. We, uh, the coach Mm. works with them to sort of do that, but, and they set their goals each week. So, you know, in collaboration with a coach, because these are fourth graders up through eighth graders. So you can't just completely say, you're on your own here. but, you know, we, we work through that process of helping them set goals and see if they achieve those goals and adapt those goals. We do not have grades at Prisma because we really believe in kids being motivated by the desire to be their best. Um, we provide really rich feedback. So what our coaches are doing is mm. providing sort of all along the way where kids are working on something, the co- coaches are providing feedback and getting the kids to go back and revise and iterate so that ideally by the time they finish something, they have really done their very best work as opposed to just doing what they need to do to get an A or whatever their goal is with a grade. Um, so that's the independence piece. Um, collaboration, I mean, just so much of what we're doing at Prisma is uh, kids working together with other kids. So we have everyday um, live workshops and they are absolutely not lectures. Never are the kids just sitting there listening. Um, They are all about kids discussing, um, you know, debating with one another, uh, problem solving, working in small groups to solve um, different kind of challenges. They're absolutely about kids listening to one another, um, adapting their ideas based on what they're hearing, providing their own arguments, uh, working together to solve problems, providing feedback. Um, every um, we I haven't said a lot of sort of about how our program works, but basically we have five week cycles in each cycle has kind of a broad theme so Mm. I mentioned the next theme is build a business right now it's uncharted territories where the kids are learning um, about deep sea exploration and space exploration Um, and there's every cycle kids are working on a project now sometimes those projects are independent but um, often kids are able to choose to work with others on their projects um you know every, every day kids start their day with what we call stand up which is their coach and the same group of kids getting together and sharing with one another um you know practicing sort of presenting to one another sometimes they do collaborative games so again that's a whole level of sort of being a part of a group and being a member of a group and supporting mm. others in the group so yeah we may be a virtual program Uh, But there is a ton of relationship building and collaborating and problem solving with others that's that's happening. It's it's something we strongly focus on. 
Yeah, well, that's great. Well, that is an excellent answer. Very thorough. Thanks for that. Yeah, I I really just wanted to understand like what you meant by independent, what you meant by, mm. you know, working with others. Although I had, you know, I have some good ideas, you know, certainly I'm in this space and we're trying to do these things too. So mm. yeah, so independent, just to clarify what you meant for myself, um, you're saying that it's that um, desire to and ability, I think both, right? Mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. manage your own time and what you want to be and to right. sort of direct your own path. Is that is that a little bit what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's okay. to it's to assess, but fundamentally, it's to create, make a plan, and achieve your goals. I think mm -hmm. without someone standing over there. An adult standing over there doing it all for you. Um, yeah. You know, you, you, anybody who's working on a team still very much has to be independent in their ability sure. to get things done. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that's a, an apt um, definition of, of how we'd think about independence. Yeah, and that's, that's uh, I, I think it's a little bit more holistic too, if I'm going to take a value stance. I, you know, I would say, you know, my dad fortunately asked me a lot of these questions as I was growing up. And so he trained me to think this way, you know, from, I don't know how young, but basically that, you know, I'm in charge of where I'm going and he mm -hmm. taught me some budgeting. Um, and so I learned a little bit of that, um, you know, budgeting your time and budgeting your money, I feel like are equally important. And, yeah, and, absolutely. um, you know, running a little business is a great way to learn how to do that. Very like they're very kind of brutal lessons, but they they better learned earlier. <laughs> so, right. Absolutely. but that that collaborative element, this is the thing that fills me with a little bit of fear, to be honest, um, mm -hmm. because I see um, kind of a, I wouldn't say like the entire, you know, Gen Z crowd is is. um you know, without hope. What I see when I, because I actually, I'm interviewing people all the time to hire them and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be younger. Mm -hmm. We have some interns who are in high school right now. Um, and they're doing some great things. So we could do a podcast about that later. But what I see is a very clear separation from those who know how to talk to people and make eye contact and yeah. smile and just basic things and be honest and ask good questions, which are just fundamental skills to relating to other people. And then there yeah. are those who are uncomfortable in their own skin and they yeah. don't really know what they want in life. And you happen to bump into them and you feel awkward because you don't know what they're trying to get out of life. And so you don't know how to relate to them or to not relate to them. So you mm -hmm, talk about the mm -hmm. weather or something, so it's not awkward. <laughs> you mm -hmm, feel that you mm -hmm. feel the space, and so I see just this huge, um, this huge kind of gap, and and we're trying to make some efforts in in that area to encourage collaboration and talking to each other and making friends and mm -hmm. playing video games together and and working on projects together. But um, do you, you know, without without being too dramatic, I mean, do you see that? there is kind of a special issue that other generations have not had, or is this just a continue that every generation has had to, to deal with and they're just younger. So they don't look like the older generations right now. Yeah. Oh, you know, I don't, I don't call myself a generational expert. So if you caveat, well, that, neither am I, I right? <laughs> right. But, um, uh, yeah. uh, look, I mean, um, Particularly in, in my previous company, we hired a lot of young people straight out of college. I think that the, what you're talking about, about self-confidence and communication skills, that is every generation, I think, has some people mm -hmm. that thrive in that way and some people that don't. And certainly at Prisma, both of those things we focus on a lot. So yeah. communication is one of the core skills that we focus on. And that's why, you know, at the end of every cycle so i mentioned that there's these five-week cycles kids work yeah. on projects they present their project every cycle to the whole prisma community so that's parents 
and sometimes grandparents show up and um so you know that that ability to speak in front of a group the kids are practicing all the time we have entire um you know weekly workshops dedicated to you know the either socratic discussion or debate and discuss or that sort of thing getting kids to feel comfortable making arguments and um speaking you know using their words to present their ideas and some kids that is supernatural to them and other kids that is just really challenging and we've got to bring them out you know we have some kids that can't present to the whole community the first time around and so we just let them pre-record their presentation and over time they get used to it so i think Mm. in any generation there's some people that thrive um in sort of communication it just comes naturally and others that have to build it but anything can be developed and so i think that's a question of how do you help people develop those skills even if it's hard for them um generationally i would say what i've seen more and it comes back to this idea of independence and um sort of self-motivation and um hard work i feel like i've seen a little more of sort of uh and and you know i've read quite a few books about this of kids that have been so helicoptered by their parents um and by this sort of the school system um, and what I mean by that is sort of every, every roadblock, there's been someone there to help them figure mm-hmm. it out. And they've sort of been spoon fed to some extent. This is what you need to do next. And this is what you need to achieve. And this is your next milestone. And if you just get A's and you just get good test scores, then you're going to get into good college and then life will be wonderful. And sure. then you just I see and hear stories about kids that either they burn out in that system or they actually do exactly what they were meant to do and they achieve their good grades and they get their good SAT score and they get into a good college and then they're like, what the heck am I supposed to do now? And they struggle (laughs) to sort of both know what they should even be striving for now because they've striven for that one thing their whole lives so far, which is to get into college. Um, And two, that they don't know how to look after themselves. I mean... You know, I, you hear about kids that, whose parents are calling college professors advocating on their behalf. I mean, at a certain point, oh, man, yeah, people need to advocate for themselves and fail and learn what that's like. And, um, and so that is a little bit of a generalization of a genera- of a generation, which it is a super generalization because you cannot, it's an entire generation, right? Like everybody's different. And sure, like sure, sure. Super yeah. amazing independent people. And, and it's not like you can't learn independence later. You can. And so, um, but that is something I feel like um, is, is uh, based on reading that I've done is maybe something you could say about sort of our current generation of young 20 somethings uh, relative to perhaps previous generations. And I think, you know, it also comes down to, I think previous generations were less protected. They were able to get out and explore more. And now there's sort of this sort of like protecting of kids, which I think has consequences. So there's my two cents. I'm not an expert. Yeah, no, that's, that's okay. That's okay. We're, we're not, we're not claiming to be, um, Mm. but you know, as, you know, as parents, we're also concerned for ourselves. Like we're trying to figure this out. And I, I actually yesterday, um, I was at this class and I said, I'm not going to help you for 10 minutes. So Mm -hmm. whatever you need to do to figure this out, you can help each other work together. But I'm going to set my timer for 10 minutes. And then any questions you have at that time, I can answer. But I need you to try to figure things out. You're going to run into things that you don't know how to do. And then I just didn't help him for 10 minutes, right? Which is just heresy in a public school system, right? Like, how, right. how dare right. you, <laughs> right? Like, know that these children have questions and right. refuse to answer them. You know, I, of course, did it with a smile and, like, and I believe that they can figure this stuff out. So that, that might be different than just straight up ignoring um, some mm-hmm. children. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But you know what? They did just fine. And they figured yeah. it out. And I, and I went over to their table after those 10 minutes, which for, you know, these were five and six year olds. So not oh, quite, yeah, like, not quite yeah. in, in fourth grade uh, through eighth grade, which I, I don't think we said out loud, but I, that's what you focus on, right? Fourth yeah. through eighth grade. Yeah. Okay. So just, yeah, just back- so everybody knows. Um, yeah. So these are five and six year olds and um, a seven year old or two. And 
you know, they did okay. And mm. they, I'll just be specific because specifics are fun. A child in Scratch Jr. made an, an app or a little animation that uh, there was a red dog and he was in a park and he went over to a hot dog. And then when you tap on the hot dog, it, the hot dog would disappear, implying that the dog ate it. And then you tap mm-hmm. on the dog and the dog would return to their original location. And for a six-year-old, that was mighty impressive because I said, right. we got a little class participation. I said, you know, what do we want to make a project about? Like, what's an animal? A dog. Okay, great. What's a color? Red. All right. Great. Um, and uh, what's a food you guys like? Okay, great. Let's put them all together. I want you to put a hot, I want you to put a dog, a red dog in a project eating a hot dog. I don't care how you do it. I'm ex- like, I'll see you in 10 minutes. And they, mm-hmm. they all did different dogs and, right. and there were a couple different shades of red and they all had to draw their own hot dog cause there was no asset for hot dog. And it was pretty cool to see. And, yeah. um, you know, the app's not too terribly hard but i mean they they got through a couple of issues yeah Yeah. so i i do think and you brought up the word fail and i kind of want to dig into that word because there's some Mm -hmm. connotations there in in uh our western culture that i think maybe we should break down a little bit but um you know they run into these problems or roadblocks or what what have you these little failures um, mm-hmm. and then they overcame them and then, yeah, they totally did have a couple of questions and I was able to help them, um, and show them maybe a little bit more efficient way to do things. You right, know, for this right, kid, right. you had to tap on the hot dog to make it disappear. I showed him a way that sensed when the two objects came together and mm-hmm. automatically disappeared the hot dog. Right. So as soon as the right, dog, right, right. you know, he was able yeah. to do that. So there is a role for a teacher. I really believe that. Yeah. Um, but, oh yeah. But, Oh, hugely. But, yeah. but sometimes you have to encounter the problem first before the information even really matters. So Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, at, at Prisma, a huge part, hugely important part of our model is, is our coaches. And, you know, they are gifted and highly qualified teachers, but we call them coaches because they really are there, sort of to your point, to not teach you what to do or how to think, but to help you find the tools to learn um, what you need to do or, or to, to um, formulate your own ideas and opinions. But to your point, um, you know, our, our approach or our philosophy is that if a kid has a question, they're stuck in there with some kind of math problem, is not to tell them what the answer is, but to help them find the tools where they can next time figure it out on their own. So it's, yeah. um, you know, it's really like, teach a person to fish i guess it's that kind of philosophy don't just give them the fish and they'll keep needing the fish needing to ask you but sort of help them find the tools but but very much um you know our coaches are there to to help uh be a resource for kids to to sort of help them figure out how they're going to help themselves basically and to just really empower them and you you talked earlier about you know kids lacking confidence it's very hard to achieve in school or in life if you fundamentally don't believe in yourself so a really important part of our coaches is just believing in the kids and helping them to believe in themselves because that is sort of baseline for both being happy in in your life and really achieving in your life i think yeah well yeah i think you're absolutely right i do want to dig in a little bit to this word like fail because Mm -hmm. i think we both used it um Mm -hmm. The, the way that it's commonly used in, in a public school system is, you know, like, I failed a class, right? And yeah. Or a test. I failed a test. Yeah. yeah. And if you fail a class, it's basically like, it's like non-recoverable. Like, mm-hmm. you have to do it completely over again. It's almost like you went to the grocery store and you came back with nothing, but also you spent mm-hmm. money for some, but mm-hmm. you also got nothing, right? So it's mm-hmm. like... It just it just seems like complete zero. And I think if if I had to guess, the failure that we're talking about is a little bit more perhaps like falling where you, you yeah. fall, but maybe you fall forward and you got an involuntary push up mm-hmm. <laughs> out of it because you fell down. 
and then you you have to get back up but i think you you like learn something and you learn how to navigate around something can can you explain what you mean by either a problem or a failure and and how that can be useful in the i think it's probably a better word is maybe like obstacle Mm. that like a roadblock that you know when you're um trying to you know kids will have our learners will they like i said they work on a project every cycle and they'll they'll often start off with these really grandiose ideas of what they want to achieve and then find that they actually the idea is bigger than the time that they have to really achieve it or maybe they wanted to um you know develop this game and and they 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 find that they actually it didn't work out or um so i think it's yeah i i actually can't think of a situation at prisma in the way that we um, develop our curriculum and our approach where you you could actually objectively say you failed this or you didn't fail this Mm. but it's more like because we don't there's no concept of failing a class failing a project i mean like i said we we do we give feedback and it's really always tailored towards what we think this kid is capable of achieving so we might say we don't think you did as well as you could have done here. We, we think you can. And that, that would be a case of let's go back and iterate and let's do even better. But there's sort of not a concept. You fail this. Um, but it's more like you've hit a roadblock. And some kids, I think, in the face of that will give up or get mm-hmm. disillusioned or just not know what to do. I think what we want to develop at Prisma is like, roadblocks are totally natural you'll bump into them all the time what are you going to do when you bump into it you know yeah. Yeah. pick yourself up and find another way um but pick yourself up that's the most important thing and so i think it's and that sort of relates to um something that gets thrown around in education a lot but which we really might believe in developing in our kids this idea of growth mindset so this idea that we're not given this sort of um that ability in math when you're born and you're either good at math or you're not good at math and there's nothing you can do about that we just talked about it in the in the context of communication some people you know public speaking comes really naturally others it's terrifying but in all cases you can get better at something you can grow if you put in the effort and so that's something that we very much believe in sort of um helping the kids to understand that there's no fixed ability levels here yeah yeah Awesome. Well, I have a little bit of a fun question for you. So oh, this okay. is like, where did the name Prisma come from? Prisma. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm just super curious. Is there a story behind that? Um, well, uh, you know, we, we brainstormed a, a bunch of different names and as you probably know yourself, when you try to find available URLs and every combination is, oh, yeah. <laughs> is found, yeah, is uh, already used. And, and so in fact, um, just so people are listening, you find Prisma at joinprisma.com. It's not prisma.com. I had to do some digging. Yeah. <laughs> joinprisma.com. Um, but honestly, we really like this idea of, um, a prism. And if you shine a light on it, a white light on a prism at exactly the right angle, then it turns into a a rainbow or a prism. And sort of, uh, you know, that's a bit of an abstract way of saying, like, if you take a kid, a little bit of a blank slate, and you sort of give them the right ingredients, then they can really shine in a way that that they wouldn't otherwise have done. And so I think that, you know, and we use prism in in a number of ways. We have our prism or prismatic powers which are sort of the the core powers or the core um the capabilities that we want to develop in kids uh like curiosity and problem solving and communication collaboration we've talked about a few of them another one that we haven't talked about that we we care a lot about is designers mindset um ethical decision making is something we really instill in our kids but so we sort of play on that that idea of the prism quite a bit with with our model but that's how it originally came well that is really fun yeah i know you it's funny we we tried to change our name from coder kids we tried to pick a different name something you know more Uh interesting or more trade you you can't trademark coder kids anybody can anybody Mm, can because it's so generic um or at least that's what our people have told us. <laughs> so we tried really hard, and we just couldn't find a better one. Oh, it had now. Yeah. And so we had the URL Cutter Kids TX, mm-hmm. and then um, 
eventually the the codedkids um, dot com became available, and so oh, we, nice. we snagged that. So we got lucky. Uh, yeah. We got really lucky. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, that's interesting when you're you're picking names. You're like, what's appropriate? Like, what makes sense? And just nothing made what's more sense memorable. than Coder Kids. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what what can work in other languages because we have a very global spell? Vi- yeah, like very global vision at, at at Prisma. We're very much focused on um, you know allowing kids to get to know and to collaborate with and work with kids. Right now, it's predominantly um, North America wide, but we have some sure. kids internationally. But the vision is that we would have kids all over the world that are collaborating together because we think that's also just really important nowadays. Um, and so yeah. you've got to make sure you don't pick a name that like in another language has this really bad meaning um so there's a lot to think about for sure yeah yeah like especially when like making up words that's like a very much a silicon valley thing right like where they're just like making up words (laughs) there's the right right there's like the the naming school where there you either choose like a literal name like something that physically means like that's that's us you can translate our name directly because it is it's just like a thing and then there's like the esoteric which is right. just like, hey, I made this name up because it's fun and it sounds good. And then there's like things in the middle. So like yeah. mis- like mi- misspelling of like, uh, like lift, right, is like an example where it's like, right. you get an idea, you're getting a lift, but we threw in a Y because it's trademarkable. Right, <laughs> so, right, right, yeah. right, right, right. Or Prisma, which is like prism. Yeah. Prism. So, but it yeah, sounds yeah, good. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I know not not a question you probably thought you were going to get, but um, I really liked your answer. That was that was great. Um, what are good? So we've talked a lot about the philosophy of, of Prisma, your philosophy, um, and how that works and how kids can get better. All this stuff is is really important. I guess I want to to ask maybe just some like quick tips, um, mm-hmm. you know, for someone who's, um, you know, say studying or, or doing, you know, working on their project. Um, do you recommend um, a, any kind of music to listen to? Or is there a way to create a like a learning environment in a home? I know oh, a lot of a lot of people like for me, I've got this, you know, green screen, right? Mm-hmm. You see, I just pushed it back. And there's some this it's an actual uh-huh. room here on the right. planet. Um, uh-huh. How do you recommend a certain um, way to kind of set the tone for yeah. learning, oh, or we, is there some way to do that? We do actually. I mean, we we talk to kids about well, we what do we call them? Prisma ready, I think we call it. Um, but sort of, what are the things you need to do to be ready to to bring your bring your best every day? And it starts with having a nice quiet workspace that you feel good in that has the things you need that's not too cluttered and uh that's quiet um so that's sort of you know we we literally talk to the kids about create a workspace and this is this is some ways to create a workspace uh we tell them be hydrated be fed uh you know come come with your get dressed don't come in your pajamas although we're not you know it's it's casual but you know like come ready Mm -hmm. um uh and and we talk about breaks too like if if you are you know not in a good headspace that's sort of one of the beautiful things about our model is it is flexible so in regular school you show up at 8 30 and you leave at three and you have this class this class this class and if you're not in the right headspace too bad you have to show up or you miss it for Prisma, I mean, we have certain workshops each day that are sort of it's a it's a it's a fixed time that you show up. Although if a kid doesn't show up for a reason, that's okay. Um, but uh, otherwise, you get a lot of flexibility around when you do your asynchronous or your independent work. So if you are not in a good headspace right now, then you can choose to do it later. But we also talk a lot about just getting up, getting outside. Um, moving your body, you know, building in sort of body breaks and physical time um, into your day. So things like that are, are really important too. Body breaks. That's really, that's great. Mm-hmm. Um, that sounds better than bone breaks. Um, yeah, I would, <laughs> we do, um, we definitely recommend uh, jumping jacks. So in our, when in our summer camps, we do like three hours at a time. And oh, wow, yeah. 
the only way that works is because you know our instructors are doing jumping jacks and push-ups right. and and right. you know there's like two built-in 20 minute breaks that you know the kids have to take and right and right. then three hours goes by so fast you wouldn't believe it you know yeah it really makes me wonder like how on earth i did 50 minute class periods with 30 kids right like I don't, rem I don't even remember how I did it, right. but I just felt like you were strapped to a bullet train and you had to like, you know, I was a history teacher. So then I was like, I have to cover like a hundred years today in 50 right. minutes <laughs> and they have to remember right. this. And so I still feel even a bit rushed in an hour and a half or three hours, but I just couldn't, I just couldn't do less than that so yeah you're yeah. absolutely right we're physical beings i have to go on runs or do push-ups or something and you know i'm not five anymore and i still have to do mm -hmm. this otherwise i get grumpy um, right right so it's one of the um, yeah. it's one of the things we've discovered is really nice about virtual learning there's many great things um but one of them is just the ability that like because some kids they really just need to move around and and Sitting still in a chair is actually very challenging and certainly doesn't get them in the right headspace. And so what's great about yeah. um, a virtual model is we can have kids that are bouncing around and one, walking around and stretching and doing what they need to do, but they're still engaged, they're still listening, they're still participating. It's not bothering anyone. Whereas in a classroom, if everybody starts getting up in their chair and stretching and doing a few yoga moves, it disrupts everybody. Um, the, the, so that has been a really beautiful piece to virtual learning that we didn't necessarily anticipate when we started. The other thing that we didn't anticipate is just how amazing it is, I mentioned it before, to have kids from all over the United States. And I think we're also in, oh, how many countries? About five other countries as well, or maybe more than that now all learning together because school usually brings together kids uh, not only from the same town but from the same zip code so from the yeah. same neighborhood and there's generally a lot of you know pretty it's pretty homogenous in neighborhoods and so we have kids from like florida and maine and hawaii and costa rica and spain and you know they're discussing these topics and they're able to bring so much more learning to each other I think by being able to say well this is what's happening in in my part of the world um and you know that's something that virtual learning can bring that a sort of bricks and mortar school model where everybody you know lives in a very small geographic radius can't do and we found that to be a really beautiful part of what we're doing yeah yeah we recently had kids sign up from Saudi Arabia and Canada and awesome. New York and California and a couple from Belgium so yeah I mean I, I, you know, I don't think you expected it, maybe a little bit more than I did, but I, I was like, you know, we're here in Houston, maybe we'll get up, you know, we'll get a couple of signups here and there, but I, I, I really thought that, you know, people in Silicon Valley or in, in New York, like, they had other options, but mm -hmm. we're still getting signups there, and then from the Carolinas okay. and, and everywhere else, and I, I do think you're, this thing you're talking about where students are just it's just normal for them it's it's normal to talk to people from all over i totally. think it's something that i've taken for granted living in houston now for a decade is that i get to talk to people from all walks of life we have a, a lot of immigrants here from uh from india from mexico from um all over Asia, all different parts. Mm -hmm. We've got a huge Vietnamese population um, that um, a team I was on actually wrote some of the history about in the Houston History Magazine. That was like when I was still in college. Um, mm -hmm. they've, they've brought huge wealth of talent and culture to Houston. Um, and then there's Japanese and Koreans and, and everybody else you could possibly imagine lots of uh, pakistanis just mm -hmm. everybody that you can possibly think from anywhere on the globe you can find them in houston and their food which i mean come on you gotta you gotta love that so mm -hmm. i just i've i've taken this for granted for the past decade it's like oh yeah this is everyone's experience but you know right. in the middle of montana it's not it's Right. You know, it's like right, right, right. everybody just kind of looks like you and probably kind of thinks like you and and maybe right. they're not even that many kids to interact with. And so this is one of the things that I was 
really hoping for before the pandemic, I was hoping to sponsor some schools in the middle of the country, you know, not in big city centers, not, you know, didn't have access to the kind of like learning environments or coding at all, right? Because that's what we mm -hmm. focus on. And I'd, I'd thought of some ideas and I never acted on anything. Then the pandemic happened and I'm getting all these parents that are realizing in the middle of the country, especially where they didn't have access and it may have been a money problem and it may not have been. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And, you know, kids are kids. They need these experiences, whether they're rich or poor or somewhere in between. Right. And, right. um, some of these parents have been just overwhelmingly enthusiastic because they realize, hey, I can get the best teachers from anywhere now. Like, right. we're good to go. <laughs> so that has, and just like feeling of their joy, I'm thinking mm -hmm. of a specific parent who's going to remain nameless here, but they, um, you know, that really brought some joy into my life to realize like, hey, we, we really are changing the world a little bit incrementally in the education right. space. So Right, right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you totally so much for, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming today. It has been an absolute blast. Is there anything else that you'd like to say or an invitation you'd like to extend? I, I mean, only maybe to, I, I probably didn't give a very good quick headline of actually what Prisma is and who might be interested in checking us out. I mean, it, Go for it, it. it, it at a basic level, we are, so it's a comprehensive educational program for fourth mm -hmm. through eighth graders. We did say that before, who are learning from home. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it's a very sort of, um, you know, we are certainly not traditional homeschooling because as we've talked a lot, it's, we put together cohorts of kids that learn and meet together every single day. And we provide this very, um, uh, our own proprietary curriculum that's very hands-on and project-based and sort of rooted in the real world. We provide coaching. So it's sort of a, a version of education that provides all the flexibility that homeschooling provides where people can be based wherever they want to be based and they can have very uh, flexible schedules, but with um, just a, a really rich sort of social experience and the support of a very experienced teacher who we call a coach. Um, and so, yeah, I would say any families that uh, have already been homeschooling or that during the pandemic discovered that, you know what, this whole distance learning thing actually worked quite well for our child because they could go at their own pace or it worked quite well for our family. Um, mm. And we'd love you to check us out uh, Definitely. because we've certainly been finding um, some very happy kids and happy families with our model. Okay. Well, we'll put the link in the show notes. It's joinprisma.com. And, uh, you know, thanks for joining us, Victoria. Um, we'll go ahead. Thank you and, so much. Yeah. Whatever links you want to send, we can we can put in the, the description of the YouTube video. And, okay. and uh, if anyone wants to reach out to you, where, where would be the best place for them to do that? Uh, they can go onto our website um, or they, they can email me. I'm Victoria okay. at joinprisma.com. Perfect. Well, thank you so much again for coming on today. Uh, I wish you the best, and and I hope that uh, you know some parents you know get the chance and and give you a shot. I think. I mean, it sounds like a decent program. My son's only a year and a half old, so he's got a little bit yeah, of little time. <laughs> so, all right. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. bye.